Welcome to Three Devs and a Maybe. Now introducing your show hosts, Michael Budd, Fraser Hart, Lewis Keynes, and Ed Mann. Hello and welcome to another episode of Three Devs and a Maybe. My name's Ed Mann and today we're very lucky to be joined by Matthias Novak. How are you doing, Matthias? Oh, I'm doing fine. And you? I'm doing very good, thank you, sir. Very good indeed. Uh, thank you again for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Um, for the audio, would you mind just introducing yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm, my name is uh, Matthias Novak. I'm, um, I'm a Dutch guy. Uh, <laughs> so I'm from Holland. Uh, I live here in uh, Zeist with uh, my family. Um, I've got uh, two kids, uh, one of four and one 13. Very interesting, uh, well, age difference. I was uh, going to say, you get the both, you pick the teenager and yeah. the baby at the same time, you've got the both pains. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But they have a lot of fun together, so uh, <laughs> that's very nice. And they are, uh, uh, well, they, they can pretty much uh, save themselves. Uh, so there, there's no, not, nothing with diapers going on, etc. So, <laughs> so that's great. Um, yeah, and um, furthermore, I'm, I'm doing lots of things uh, like at, at the professional area where I'm, I'm doing uh, a talking at conferences, but also... So I'm organizing training, uh, I write books, um, blog, uh, well, on a regular basis, um, and, well, do a lot of programming as well. So that's uh, that's sort of the, the professional side of life. Awesome. Yeah, it's a great blend. Uh, and, 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 yeah, I mean, definitely for me, you know, your blog has been very influential. Uh, you know, you, do, you cover so many interesting things and, you know, it kind of, it comes around. It's funny because I think last year you, you did documented your kind of approach now that you do and you think about architecture and stuff. And I think it's very similar to my experience and a lot of developers experiences, you know, where you've lived in the framework and then you slowly moved out of it. Uh, but you're able to articulate that so well. It's just kind of like, yes, this is how I'm thinking as well. So it's, it's very nice. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Happy to hear that. But, but before we kind of go into anything concrete, it would be very good to kind of, to kind of knuckle down really. Why should we care about architecture? I've just mentioned their architecture, you know, how we do things now, but what, what is the, you know, what is the reasoning behind, you know, the care for actually having good architecture and, and what defining really what is good architecture within our systems? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it it's, uh, <laughs> requires a bit of an answer. Uh, uh, actually, architecture is to me, always a pretty confusing term, and I think to many developers, because it's like uh, you can become the team's architect, you can do architecture together, but you can also do it alone. You can talk about um, the architecture of the system where services are connected in some way. I usually talk about architecture in, in terms of if you have one application, how do you structure it? How, how do you design? Like, yeah, basically the overall structure. You can always look at the design at the code level, the objects, the classes, but there's also the, the, the overall picture uh, of what's the application, w what it looks like if you if you look at it from a distance. So that's that's the kind of architecture I'm uh, usually dealing with. And yeah, like why is it important? It's um, mostly a matter of um, how can you keep it manageable? How can you keep the application uh, manageable in terms of people joining the team, trying to understand what's going on? But also for yourself, like many of these issues are about where do I put a certain class or uh, like what's the right place for this? Which classes can use each other? Which uh, objects can, can make calls to each other? To me, this is what, what architecture is about. And and with that, then, you know, you mentioned there, what, you know, who can talk to who and et, et cetera. And, and really that comes into the layering. So, so what actually then is a layer? We typically have like a database layer and, you know, application domain layers. What actually is a layer? Yeah, another very interesting question. And I'm I'm doing workshops on these topics and it's always like, yeah, well, a layer is a very interesting concept, but it isn't really anything. <laughs> if you try to uh, point it out in the code, <laughs> there's nothing like, nothing like a class that's called a something something layer. Or it's basically a way of looking at your code and seeing that uh, certain things are really different from other things. And um, yeah, I think you mentioned uh, database or uh, domain layer. And this is interesting because, yeah, the, usually you will have something like uh, maybe a view layer and uh, traditionally uh, MVC. I've come to uh, sort of combine all of these framework related things into what I call and what many others call uh, as well, uh, an infrastructure layer. 
So everything related to connecting the pieces, basically, uh, to, th to the frameworks, but also to the world outside, as I call it. Uh, so other services, databases, the file system, uh, even basically uh, system parts like uh, the clock, the system clock, or the random device, everything that you need to, to make your application work, but are not really under your own control. This is all part of infrastructure. And uh, so, so it's actually a pretty big layer. Uh, but then, well, you, you can separate what is not yours or what is, what is connecting to the world outside and, um, basically the core of your application, like the, the logic that you put into it, like domain logic, but also the use cases, like what is your application able to do for the users? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because as you mentioned there, you know, what is a layer? A layer is kind of nothing. It is an abstract concept uh, and, and it takes some kind of getting used to, to kind of really think, and especially in a mindset, you know, like when we move on to talk about hexagonal architecture and stuff to, and DDD kind of things, you know, violations of this, you know, like you have to see it in the code. It's not very, it can't, it sometimes isn't as explicit, you know, that you're violating something and it can, you know, you really have to kind of keep thinking about it at this high level and really you know that that's what you're kind of looking at as opposed to these you know the small implementation details don't really matter as opposed to the bigger picture of you know kind of how things talk to each other and whatnot uh, in one of your blog posts you, you've mentioned like layering versus indirection and i think that's a very interesting concept but would you mind maybe elaborating a bit more on that uh, yeah and, and i think this is also related to um adding another layer another indirectness to the to the system uh, isn't really helping or helpful so the if you look at the code and you see all kinds of calls to well basically indirect things like it doesn't show you what you're really doing but you're making a call to some very generic interface or uh, or something that it, that it's very unclear i think that the whole layering approach is just meant to be achieving the opposite looking at the code it should be more clear in fact what's going on all the technical stuff is behind interfaces that uh, are very communicative like they they tell you what what they are what is the general idea behind them? What what are you trying trying to achieve? Uh, and I think in in that sense, I, I don't know from who this this term is, but it's um, I, I usually like to think about what do I need and then sort of dream it up, you know. Uh, so instead of saying, oh, I need uh, an ORM, I need an entity manager to uh, to get myself this entity, I'm thinking like, uh, where would I get this from? Basically, if if I didn't know about the existence of such a thing, I would say I want to have to have it from some sort of a collection. Uh, and then I know that we have patterns for this, so we can say, oh, this is a, basically it's a DDD pattern, a domain-driven design uh, pattern. We say, oh, we call this a repository. This is something that, that takes care of our objects, that, that can save them for us, but we can also retrieve uh, objects from it. And so I think of, oh, I, I want a repository here. Uh, you know, and, and then I start with an interface and the rest comes later, all of the... The, the details, like you said, the, the, the small stuff uh, that I don't want to care about now, uh, yeah, it will be somewhere behind the, um, the implementation for that interface. Absolutely. It's those deferring those decisions. And I think that's that's where I came. You know, when you first start off programming, you live in a world where, you know, you kind of are dealing with implementation a lot. So say, you, as you mentioned there, you're like, oh, I need to go to a database. And you go, oh, a relational database. And you kind of will use this infrastructure stuff. Uh, as just kind of you're designing in that infrastructure way where you're already essentially kind of binding yourself to this kind of decision. Whereas really what you can do is like you're saying there is abstract it away to I want a collection. doesn't matter where I get that collection. I can change that. I could decide that at a later point. And actually it's really about being lazy. It's about being more lazy about it than I can decide on that later. You know, I can I can work that out later and, and really you reap a lot of benefits from it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very interesting approach. And it's, it's um, basically the opposite of what lots of also programming is courses are about uh, i find that um, programming education is most often about how to use this this framework or how to use this library or how to uh, how to make a, a network call how to make to use guzzle for that or well whatever tool and then uh yeah you basically skip the um, the point where you where you had to wonder what am i doing here what do i ne really need uh, another example that i sometimes use is uh, when i would like to get an exchange rate for uh, for converting some some amount of money and there are services for this like so so i can make a network call an api call and say what give me the exchange rate for today's uh, uh, conversion from US dollars to euros. And then I use uh, 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 an HTTP client like Guzzle, for instance. It's like, oh, I need to make a call uh, to over the network. So I, I instantiate it right here on the spot. I create an HTTP client. I make a web request. But what I'm really doing is I want something that I can ask 
for an exchange rate. So what would you call that? Well, maybe some exchange rate, maybe also repository, but maybe also provider or something that can tell me, that can just give me an exchange rate. I don't care about uh, making a network connection yet. You know, that's, that's, that's details. So that's where I think abstraction starts. It's like you skip the details, you skip wondering, how do I get this actually? Uh, <laughs> you just think of how would you call that, uh, that thing where I can get it from. Funny, though, because it does take a while, as you say, when you first start development, it's very concrete to actually it's harder to become more abstract because your mindset is so much more in the weeds of kind of bug tracing through things and, you know, being very concrete on things. Yeah. And it's, it's very confusing anyway, because abstraction often involves introducing an interface. But uh, like it's very confusing in this sense because if it's not your own interface, for example, Guzzle will, will also have something like an HTTP client interface. So it feels like if you start using that interface, it's abstracted, right? But then it's not abstracted because it's still talking about HTTP and making a network call. So you always have to take that next step and use an interface, but also think of some more abstract concept where you remove all, uh, all these details the implementation you just went screaming out at you and that's yeah. exactly you know when we move on to hexagonal um one, one kind of i think more i think it's a bit far-fetching question would be you know what goes into like then a successful layering of an application like what what things do you have to think of and and kind of i suppose throughout time have to continue to think of yeah it's a it's a good question um i think it starts with a good set of of rules so you know which things belong in which layer and but at some point, you may feel like um, uh, keeping this very clean separation between the layers is also introducing a few less useful classes or basically, like as an example, I would say um, a very interesting case is a query object where you maybe define a certain query. Like I want, I want to query for products. So this query object has some properties, like maybe if it's uh, in stock, for example, or what kind of uh, dimension should should it should it have? And then providing this query object uh, to a repository would be able to convert it to an actual list of products. And then th there is there is some code in there that will transform this HTTP request object that you get from your framework into such a query object that you can pass along to the repository. But then clean separation means that the query should not know anything about uh, a request object because it's it's part of the core in, and a request is part of infrastructure. It's part of the framework. So <laughs> and. This is the point where you start to introduce more classes and more code to make it completely decoupled. Uh, for now, at least, this is your framework, uh, and and you shouldn't work too much like around it. So yeah, in these cases, I usually suggest just have a method on the on the query object, say from request, and then let let it take the request data and copy it into the um, the query object, just to save you some some extra classes and some extra mess, basically. You know, you are being very explicit there when you do do something like that, where you know you can easily see where it's you know where what you're doing and where why it's there uh, and that it can be changed easily because it's co-located in one place right right so that's that's one of the um, the rules as well uh, it's the same for let's say uh, mapping configuration for your entities like where does the data go for this property in which column should we store it to me it's very convenient to have it next to the property itself so we know that when something changes there uh, we see what else is involved but for some this is uh, impure or you know this this shouldn't happen uh, but i'm like yeah okay well we we keep to certain rules in in most of the places but we can always uh, cheat a bit here and there it depends doesn't it <laughs> is the is the saying we obviously we're talking a lot of things in the abstract and you know you kind of push things away and you do do try and push and defer decisions but the value in sometimes knowing what you're using so taking advice, i mean databases are one very common use case so the value in knowing that maybe, okay, I'm going to sign myself up to be using Postgres and then I'm going to be able to take advantage of certain Postgres features that I know exist. And obviously that's an infrastructure thing or, you know, implementation detail, but the, you know, the positives and the pros I'll get out of that. How, how what, what are your opinions of that? Are you very pure in what you design or are you more, you know, kind of deal with it as it comes and, you know, on a case by case basis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> it's interesting. It, it, I think it has two aspects. The, the postponing the, 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 these decisions is a, the option to do this is great about uh, layering, but then postponing also means that you can make uh, better decisions uh, in terms of choosing which technology you're going to use, which database or whatever else uh, is involved in your system. And yeah, I'm, I don't know if, if there is any real concrete advice for that. Uh, uh, for sure, it will depend on uh, on your situation, but um, I, I still keep to the let's uh, let's not think about all of those details, all of those possibilities for this, for example, a database. 
Uh, I just want to still be able to talk in terms of objects, interfaces, and uh, what I can do with them. Uh, in, instead of uh, let's 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 now start start using this super cool feature that uh, well <laughs> it is going to be everywhere in the code base, you know. But yeah, I, I think it it can really make sense to. For example, if you talk about a repository and you just want to let it store an object, yeah, not worry about whatever else is going on uh, behind the scenes there. Well, we've touched upon it a little bit. So, you know, really, then what is the hexagonal architecture? Yeah, <clears throat> well, like uh, it's, again, a bit of a confusing concept there because if we start about layers, then the layers usually end up being inside the hexagon. <laughs> and this is the kind of thing where, um, again, well, if if you... If you would be a bit dogmatic about it, we're saying, yeah, this is not like layering is not part of hexagonal architecture. And in fact, it isn't part of it, but it works really well with this idea um, of having uh, ports and adapters. That's that's the, um, that's the main concept uh, behind hexagonal architecture. Uh, <laughs> even the word sounds sounds great, right? <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, um, this, this should be very interesting if we talk about hexagons. In fact, the, the name itself maybe isn't that relevant. So I, I usually um, pick ports and adapters to, to make sure that uh, people will uh, quickly think of ports and adapters. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, like, what would, you know, your preferred terminology for it? I think hexagonal kind of, yeah, it or it implies too much. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I, it it puts a bit too much focus, I think, on the hexagon side of, of things, like uh, or sides. Uh, I mean, having six sides is not really important in this uh, in this sense. Yeah, you have to have <laughs> six ports. Yeah, <laughs> well, you just ignore that aspect, and you're like, okay, my application has two ports, so <laughs> yeah, let's ignore about the other ones. But the idea is, in fact, that um, <clears throat> we could uh, take a look at an, an application, uh, the, the design of, of, of one application, and we recognize the fact that it has connections to the world outside again. So um, it may accept input from users who maybe send uh, uh, form data to it. Like That's, that's the usual <laughs> web application uh, use case. People fill in some form and they can submit it. And the application accepts this information. It's uh, it's basically receiving messages from from somewhere somewhere outside outside itself. And then we say that this is the this is the port. This is sort of the um, the user interface port where people can talk to this application. And on the other end, it may also communicate with other services or external things like a, a database itself. And th- these are again messages that go out. So the the inside of the application make some call, uh, well, probably through some indirection, <laughs> like a, another layer, to this world outside. And it talks or it, it speaks SQL, for example, if it talks to a relational database. And that's the idea. So we, we recognize a, a need for communication, both both incoming and outgoing. And then we also recognize that we provide basically a protocol for communication. Like uh, on the input side, it will be HTTP. And this involves a bit of web server uh, stuff, but also any web framework that you might use. All of this is part of uh, the protocol, like translating the message that comes from the world outside and and making it understandable for something in the core of our application. And on the other end, we notice that we just don't use a database for 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 anything. We want to persist uh, our domain objects with them or with it. So we sort of recognize the need to persist, to save things, to, to store things. And then it comes to making a decision about what kind of protocol do we want to support there. And it depends on our choice of database. So we can talk um, to a relational database and speak SQL. Uh, We can use uh, MongoDB and uh, store JSON documents or what's it called? I I don't know. There should be uh, (laughs) some other name for that protocol. Uh, Anyway, like the... um, we should, we recognize the need and um, uh, an abstract name for the communication that's going on, and then we can provide several implementations, and these are called uh, adapters. And those are then the decisions, the deferring of those decisions, those infrastructure kind of messy. We always kind of think of them as these messy things that you have to do to actually get the thing working for you at the end. As developers, we will find this messy stuff very interesting, and <laughs> yeah. this is the fun part as well. Yeah, <laughs> and it's also a lot of the code. Um, if you if you consider uh, the code you write for your domain mod, uh, model, the domain objects, the application services, and then consider all the rest that is needed to just hook your application, uh, uh, well, and sort of connect this connect it to the world outside. You know, that's a lot of code, uh, including the operating system uh, <laughs> itself. Like it's uh, that will be a lot of code, but also any of uh, the code that is uh, in PHP, the runtime. 
you know, and the server API and everything that that is that needs code to run. And then just at the very last moment, there is a brief call to some method on an entity that you wrote. <laughs> you know, so that's all. To me, it's always very fascinating how developers spend most of their time writing code for infrastructure. <laughs> No, absolutely. And you mentioned there, so you, you, so in hexagonal architecture, then how, how is it broken up? You've mentioned their infrastructure and then your domain, and then in the middle, then there's another layer. Yeah, well, for, for hexagonal, it's, um, it's usually just core versus um, adapters. So, um, yeah, and, and the core is basically, it doesn't know how it's connected to, to the world. You know, that, that, that's, I think, one way of designing it well. Um, so the core code will be your domain code and your application code. So the, the application services, basically. These are this is all code that is completely unrelated to, for instance, the the web framework that you use or the, the kind of file system that your application needs uh, or the database it it, it uses. Uh, so it's it's pretty much. Um, I, I sometimes feel like it's uh, it's very non physical. <laughs> so there's no touching points. There's no. Um, in fact, no touching point to the world yet. Um, if you want to really use it, which you can't uh, uh, until you add some concrete implementation for the for the outer layer, then yeah, it's it's basically no use. So you, you can write any code and well, <laughs> and you can't even do anything with it. Uh, yeah, so then you make a decision. Uh, how am I going to, to connect this application that I wrote? Um, and that's going to be using these adapters, which implement some some communication protocol. So you mentioned there that so the domain and and how do you break up then the core domain to the application and you have things like application services uh, which then go in turn to like use cases and commands and stuff it'd be really great if you could elaborate more on that mm -hmm. well I think traditionally for for web, web applications we um, have been using MVC frameworks or what they what they have been called and it's like model view controller. Uh, and I think any application that um, will tell you that it's an MVC application, yeah, in fact, also has some other layer usually that is, well, that it consists of services. Because if you are in the controller and you're, well, you want to do something with a domain object, you will feel like, yeah, I have to get it from someplace, but I also need to know how to manipulate it. And then I need to, stay, to save it somewhere. Uh, and... Very soon, you, you will see this repeating pattern. So there, uh, there is uh, going to be some extraction of this logic. Uh, and also, we feel like we don't want real business logic in our controllers. So what usually happens is uh, people create services next to, or basically in between controllers and uh, domain objects. So the, um, the idea of having these layers, uh, infrastructure, application, and domain, is that you uh, give these services a real good place. And you make them uh, like you, you just make very sure that they are in no way related to the framework you use or to the ORM that you use. And then, so as you mentioned, there's the separation between the application and then the actual domain itself. And I suppose is there, you know, is there a clear separation between those two things to you, or is that kind of one encompassing domain and then versus the infrastructure? Well, that, that's that's why I think the most important distinction is infrastructure versus uh, what I call core. Um, <laughs> so it's the application without any touching points yet. Uh, but within these layers, uh, it's still useful, I think, to have um, application services, which basically uh, implement one particular use case for the application. And then it, it consists of a bit of, well, orchestration code. So it, uh, like, usually it's just a recipe. It, it says, take take this entity call this method on it and then save it, for example, and then maybe dispatch some uh, domain events. So that, that's the kind of thing that an application service does. The domain layer simply consists of only domain model code. So these will be uh, entities and value objects, uh, domain event classes. So, um, and, and, and there is no, like there is knowledge into this domain knowledge. It's, it's, it's modeled into this code, but it doesn't do anything on its own. And the application services are the ones who coordinate the work, who will actually call methods on the entities, uh, who will create the entities or the value objects if needed. Yeah, so I always like to say it's, it's it's orchestration. No, absolutely. I think that's a really great way of kind of thinking of it, you know, kind of putting the pieces together. Um, and you, we mentioned there, so you've got the use cases. Uh, what actually, so we mentioned there what a use case is, but you also have commands and then command handlers and stuff and command buses. I'm just wondering kind of the differences between them. And in fact, actually, you know, you've made yourself the simple bus. So it'd be really interesting to kind of discuss that. Yeah, in, in fact, for a, a command bus a, a library, like simple bus, in fact, uh, but also uh, Tactician. And uh, recently we've had um, a Symphony Messenger 
uh, join uh, join the party and they um they they are all very simple libraries it's just uh, basically really not more than 100 lines of code i think the idea is that uh, with a command bus you can say there's there's one entry point for this whole application layer uh, or basically every application service can be reached uh, through this command bus. Like usually you will have a, a um, an application service that, that just does one thing. I usually take the example from uh, uh, meetups where you have developer meetups in the, in the local, in some local place and you want to schedule a meetup. So this is clearly a command. I, I want to do this. Uh, so I say to the system, schedule meetup. And then I have a a schedule meetup service, an application service that is able to do this. So it will create an entity called meetup and it will save it in the database. So that's well, it's going to be remembered. This is actually the same idea where uh, instead of having a command and a command handler, uh, or like the schedule meetup command handler, uh, you could also just have an application service called schedule meetup service, and you could have basically the same code in there. So a command handler is basically a specific kind of application service, I'd say. Uh, it's just a convention. You say, in, instead of having a method with several arguments that you call on this application service, you now provide a command object, which is, yeah, it's basically containing the same values that you would usually pass as um, as method arguments. Uh, that's really interesting. And, and and so kind of in your in your um, experience and kind of your preference, what, what is your preference to, to, you know, kind of which way you would go, you know, individual application services, use cases, or using that, that extra layer of kind of having a command or the command bus? I think both are nice, but um, actually I'm, well, for, for a project I'm working on right now uh, with some people, it's, we don't need the bus or we don't use the bus because we feel like, oh, we can just directly call the application service. And yeah, it's clear that what's going on. If you're talking about indirection, the command bus itself is the example of indirection. Absolutely. You have and <laughs> a lot of, you can do middlewares and all this other, you know, yeah. very clever and useful stuff. But as you say, com- adds more complexity. It is very clever and it's it's all very nice, but um, I, we found that in this project, it's 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 actually perfectly fine to um, to just do the work right away. And uh, I think one of the advantages of the the command bus was that with the middleware, indeed, you could have start transaction and and commit transaction, like uh, wrap the whole application service in a in a transaction automatically. Almost like a unit of work kind of thing. Something, yeah, something like that. And I feel like this is not really um, important as as long as in your application service, you really just save one, uh, as it's called, an aggregate. So this is a rule for from domain-driven design where you just, um, where every change is only about one aggregate, one, yeah, you could say one entity, uh, just uh, <laughs> to skip a lot of the, the theory behind that. But um, and if you do this, then it's not very important anymore to wrap the whole thing in a transaction because you can do this at the level of the repository. Uh, and then the only thing you need to do is uh, take care of the event uh, dispatching, which was also part of the bus implementation. But you can also do this yourself. You can just say, "Oh, start dispatching right away," or at least that's that's what what we found is is a more pragmatic way. It's really interesting actually because um, so we've mentioned there the infrastructure and an infrastructure. You know, maybe your you know typical kind of web client thing, a web application request will come in, you'll do some translation, uh, you'll put it into either a use case or a command and, you know, you'll do that. The translation and uh, one of the, some of the subtle things like validation, um, kind of, you know, validation translation uh, in the infrastructure, how, how much work should really do you find to go on in the infrastructure, like to validate that something, you know, looks like that it should be to pass on, such as in your case of, you know, the meetup, making sure is the date actually look like a date? Is that responsibility of the infrastructure or is that responsibility of the application or is it a bit of both? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the, um, uh, if you use something like a command object, uh, this is part of the application layer because it's a central part of like what are the use cases that the application has to offer. Um, so what I prefer is to have validation logic in there, uh, but it depends on on the um, the overall structure of the application. If you have um, a, a rich front end, if you could basically validate uh, your data there. And then send it to the backend, uh, well, which should lead you to the idea that it, it's probably right. This this data is probably valid. Um, then you don't need a lot of backend validation anymore. Uh, but if you do, if if you just accept form data and want to send it back and say, oh, I, I have some form errors for you because this doesn't look right, then you could basically put this validation logic inside the command object. And this is something where, yeah, I, I would definitely use, uh, say, uh, the Symphony validator 
uh, which is able to look at this command object and say, this is not a date, this, is, this, sh this shouldn't be an empty string, uh, just simple things like that. And it can talk back to the, to the form component and show the form errors uh, next to the fields. And that's all very user-friendly. But indeed, the, the most confusing part here is that we have the validation that, that talks to the user so it it will be user friendly uh, messages. It won't be exceptions. <laughs> yeah, I love to see our beautifully named exceptions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And it, it's all very technical. And uh, exceptions are very hard to translate, of course, because all the um, the values are inside the string. So w with the translation string, you would like to have placeholders and uh, a catalog of um, of message keys, basically. So. You shouldn't use exceptions to talk back in this sense, but yeah, the because of the separation of the layers, uh, you only know in the infrastructure layer and in fact in in the port adapter to who you're talking. So uh, if you're in the web controller, you know that you're talking back to a user, but if you're in the application layer, you don't know who's there and you don't know what their language is or how you would even uh, communicate back. So as soon as you enter the application layer. You should just throw exceptions whenever something is is going wrong. And something that we have also noticed in the project uh, we're working on now is that if you do this, you will you will sometimes uh, trigger these well, basically 500 error pages <laughs> for the user. And then in in every case, it turns out there is something wrong with the user interface where uh, it allows users to do something that is not right. So we log these messages and we notice them. And then we feel like, oh, this is something we have to fix. Well, to make sure that the user cannot provide something that isn't isn't right. So that, that to me, it's a very interesting approach. This means that the, the domain objects can be very strict about everything. They can just uh, throw exceptions whenever they feel is something is going wrong. But we still provide some some smart aspect to the user interface where the user can basically prevent it and should never enter in this well dark space where something is <laughs> not working. Exceptional circumstances, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so it turns out that exceptions at the domain level and also at the application layer uh, level are not really uh, uh, exceptions. They are, uh, or like these exceptional situations never occur, basically. That's that's the idea. They are just meant for for protection, very strong protection. And you, so you then say then using like, so the infrastructure side of things at that level, you would then have the symphony validation stuff and then put them into the command. But the command could also, which is application, that would do some validation itself as well. And then would it throw back to the infrastructure or would it, how would it, and would it be a bit more kind of context? I suppose it couldn't be context aware really. It would have to throw and then it's up to the infrastructure again to kind of handle how it wants to do its thing. Yeah. And this is where it could be useful in some cases to, to throw custom exception types. So you, you introduce your own exception class and you can catch it and transform it into some message. Um, something we've done uh, in some cases is to use a special type of exception where it's already built in the idea that it should also be shown back to the user. So there is a translation key and some translation uh, data that, that will be substituted in the in the message. And this this is very nice. It's sort of the middle ground where exceptions can be used to talk back to the user, <laughs> uh, but just in, in these very special cases. And then it, it's still very useful for the users to have a useful message there. Absolutely. No, that's very interesting. And you mentioned actually, you know, like kind of who talks to who. Uh, and it'd be interesting to discuss maybe like what actually then is the dependency rule. Uh, and on top of that, then the, the dip, which is dependency inversion principle. Yes. Yeah. And this is like the, the, the dependency rule is um, a very simple rule. It, it just says that um, uh, layers can only talk uh, downward, basically. So if you uh, see the layers as really horizontal, then the top layer is infrastructure. Uh, the layer behind that is, or below that, uh, is the application layer. And below that, we will find uh, the domain layer. And this is basically it. We have three layers uh, from top to down, uh, top to bottom. And then we say that uh, we can only depend on layers that are deeper or lower. So infrastructure can depend on application. Application can depend on domain. Well, in fact, infrastructure could depend on domain itself, but we can never go up. So domain could never depend on application. Domain could also never depend on infrastructure and application can never depend on infrastructure. Uh, and, and that's a very, and it feels very weird because for example, an application service, it needs to store objects somewhere. Uh, so, and storage is, is part of infrastructure responsibility. Um, so how do you, how do you do this? And this is where, uh, the dependency inversion principle comes in. It, it allows you to introduce an interface, uh, or an abstraction, 
and have the implementation in a layer that is in fact higher. So you can depend on the interface while the implementation of this interface is, is in a layer uh, that's higher. That's the trick. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a very nice trick as well. And you can see then when you visually see it kind of inverting, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of, comp- they're kind of going against each other, uh, you know, with this interface. And it's a very clever way of thinking, ah, yes, that makes a lot of sense now, you know, where, you know, that I'm depending on you on, on my own, you know, kind of responsibility, something I control. And then, yeah, and you're going to get in that way. And, you know, as you say, because when you think about it, it's like, well, how can my application do anything if I can't actually talk to a database like that, you know, or, or talk to the actual infrastructure? It makes no sense until you kind of have this level, you know, this kind of indirection. In yeah, and and that that's why um, it's important to remember that the dependency rule is about dependencies at code level. Uh, so you look at the code and you see a dependency uh, that is going downward or in the same layer, and you know that it's okay, it's good, this this follows the rule. Um, but at runtime, you will still have this implementation uh, in being instantiated and injected into your application service. So that's how it works. You know, it's 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 at at code level, it looks great. And then at runtime, it, it all gets messy. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and we've mentioned, um, you know, that the fact of like, you know, why you would do, you know, why, why architecture is so important, you know, maintainability, uh, you know, keeping code, deferring decisions. And another thing is testing. And with this architecture, this hexagonal architecture, I'm just wondering, what are the different forms of testing at each of the different kind of points that you can do? Well, the funny thing is that indeed, if you have this this layering and you get it right, um, this this opens up a whole lot of possibilities for for testing. And um, uh, what you will find is that the domain layer is something that is very suitable for unit testing. Well, I mean that it has always been like that. Uh, so you can carefully design these objects and uh, call some methods and see how it all works if it works correctly. With an application layer that is completely separated from any infrastructure concern, you can run a very uh, a very nicely acceptance test. Uh, and you can, you can describe scenarios of what the application is doing, what are uh, the use cases, what are all of the example inputs that we can use and show uh, special cases or special effects. And these acceptance tests, they, they are the very very useful to write, very useful to have, but also in the case of of this application layer that is completely uh, infrastructure independent, they will be very fast to run. And that's something uh, many projects are really missing because as soon as you start talking at the higher level, what can this application do? Uh, What does it offer the user? Uh, You know, this this is where you start writing system tests usually. And these are tests that are very slow. They exercise the whole system. Uh, so they make some some web request uh, to the web server, and they then you check for the response and what's in there. And besides being slow, they are also very you, know, you can easily break them because they are often uh, looking directly for certain HTML elements. But if you call the whole system, you know there's so much involved that could break, that could could go wrong. Yeah, like that is that's a, that's a big risk for for your whole test suite. So having this option to test the application layer in isolation is a very interesting one. You can show that this application implements all of these use cases, and you can even show it in a very quick uh, way. You can run it in seconds and show that, yeah, everything is there. Everything just works. We spoke before about kind of, you know, currency conversions or, you know, working out the currency rates. And and it was exactly that kind of thing there. So, you know, one solution with that would be to hard code, you know, a direct dependency on Guzzle or HTTP client. And how would you test this now? Well, you would actually have to have an endpoint or you would have to somehow do some really horrible trickery to mock it out or to kind of inject it or do some really crazy stuff, uh, monkey patch it or whatever you'd want to do. Whereas if you add this layer of indirection or, you know, this kind of abstraction, it all goes away. And it's lovely again and you get the speed and everything. And, and it's working those out where, you know, those kind of the reason why, you know, people end up having to do these, these massive end-to-end or kind of full system tests is because they haven't broken the thing up in, you know, system tests are very valuable to work out kind of does the whole thing work as a whole, but, you know, breaking up at these different levels. Uh, and that's why this layer, you know, this indirection is not just useful for, oh, it looks pretty and it's pure. It's There's a practicality to it that I can now test this and I can really look at it, at, you know, at speed and quick. And, I'll, you know, these tests will, you know, be run all the time because people will rely on them and actually want to run them because they're quick as opposed to, these right. horrible brittle <laughs> you know functional tests yeah yeah i i know many many applications many teams have this issue where uh, they have this very large system test and it's impossible to break it up into uh smaller parts or smart parts that are easy to run or fast to run 
And that's just because then it's legacy code or code that's been too, it, it, you've already thought about the infrastructure. And the second you thought about the infrastructure, you bound yourself to that level of testing at that level already. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's one of, one of my favorite topics for, for testing as well. Many libraries, uh, well, Gersel itself, for example, offer some uh, replacement for testing. But it's still uh, still guzzle. Yeah, you know, it's still guzzle, and yeah, you still you're you're still hard coding uh, HTTP request uh, data or response data. So yeah, this is this is again where you should look for the abstraction and figure out something that you can actually uh, replace for something that is that is super fast, of course. With this then, so how do you actually structure this architecture and these architectural decisions in your code? Like, is there naming conventions you use? Is there any packages you use? Any kind of you know, layouts you kind of you know you prefer? Well, at least I like to have the layers as directories. Um, so if you, uh, well, and then basically the, the, the top level will always be uh, just the source directory. Uh, then maybe the name of the company, but you can always leave that leave that out if you want. Um, from that point, you start looking for uh, something known as, as context maybe, or um, like uh, the different parts that you can recognize of this single application some would call it modules maybe and then within every one of these modules you will or i would add directories saying uh, for every layer infrastructure uh, application domain we have one directory um, and like this is just convention as i mentioned there's there's no such thing as a layer in fact if you look at the code so you could have a layer in fact uh, being spread across multiple directories that's that's not a, a real issue but it's just very interesting to have it uh, in in plain sight to have these directories um it makes it more explicit if something gets broken or something you know gets violated while you're talking to something yes well in fact if if you uh if you would call something from infrastructure directly from your domain uh it would be very clearly uh like easy to see if you look at the for example the input import statements on the on the top of the class uh, say yeah use this file from or use this class from infrastructure you know this is a clear violation and if 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 it wasn't structured like this, that would be hard to see. Oh, and maybe it's interesting to mention um, tooling here, because if you have this directory structure in place, there's this uh, nice little tool. Um, it's called DepTrack. It's created by uh, Sensio Labs. I think it's Sensio Labs Germany specifically. It's a really simple thing, but it's very powerful if you if you follow this, this convention, because you can say that um, these and these and these directories actually correspond to these and these layers that I want to have in my application. And then you can define the rules for these layers. And you could say, indeed, like like we, like we discussed, infrastructure can depend on application, but not the other way around. And you can run this tool and it will analyze the code base and it will just tell you if there is something like that going on that is not allowed. Um, so yeah, I, that, that's an interesting uh, thing you can do if you have directories. That's very, very useful. Very useful indeed. And I think because the thing is, you can design something and then over time, you know, it's this and, and I think maybe that's another good thing to get your experience on this where, you know, in a team setting or maybe even on your own, like kind of making sure you stay strict to these kind of layers. And, and it's kind of there, you know, the there's always this thing where it could be slippage. And, and you find how people deal with that sometimes now is they'll break things up, you know, and microservices are a great idea, but they'll use microservices or they'll break up the code into very, you know, you really can't change this or you can't touch this. Whereas they could have actually done the namespace route and they could have just kept it all in one mono, you know, monolithic repo, but it's because they didn't have the kind of, you know, they knew that this could, it could be a leaky, you know, things would just bleak out. How, how do you kind of make sure that, you know, these things stay the same and stay, you know, how you want them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think in the end, there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> it will just happen. And in fact, if, if you are the one who is very strict about this, then maybe you leave the team at some point or you go work on some other project. And yeah, like it's 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 almost inevitable that something is is going to happen like that. Uh, the, the structure will disappear. It, it's it's also a matter of education. Maybe new team members uh, uh, don't get an update on this, or uh, you know, there there's no documentation at all. That's that's often the case. You know, the the original developer had some idea about it, and it was just gone. And over time, the code changes to a point where they just you can't actually discern from the code what the actual intention was. That's right. <laughs> so. You could have this this tool, uh, uh, but it's you can also work around that. You know, you could have um, uh, very sneaky dependencies going on, which follow the rules, but um, 
are actually doing something that that was not not the initial idea behind this. I, I don't have really good advice on this like to to prevent all of it <laughs> from happening. No, it's, it really is education, like you say, isn't it? Because it, it's and also it's pain points. It's it's people realizing the value of this kind of separation. Because some people can think of this as you know maybe people think of over engineering. Uh, you know when we move on to talk about CQRS, you know you mentioned that some people think it's over engineering, but until you've actually faced the points and you've had these kind of problems, you know, with test suites that are too big or architecture that just, you know, there's just, you look at a bit of code and it will do anything and everything. Yeah. You have to feel it and you have to be educated on it to actually have it. So it's really a people problem as opposed to a kind of a, something you can do a tooling. Really a, a people uh, problem. Um, it's also the, the natural course of things. It, it will be, it, but it will sometimes feel like you're fighting against chaos you know it, it it will just happen and for now it will be fine but yeah in in some time even if you don't even touch the code i i've noticed this uh even within the past year that i've i've been working on this project uh, if if you leave a module alone and then come back to it 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 will already look quite messy in some way like um, maybe <laughs> we should have done this in a different way and then you want to get back to it but there's no time of course and well maybe you should and that that's why i think that um um uh, uh, software development it, it feels a lot like uh, like gardening in this sense where this um this garden has its own life uh, and even if if you if you if you don't touch it something is going to change there something is going to happen and uh, you have to uh, well take care of it constantly you have to go back and and code could be static and not have changed but your perception of that code has changed enough to be like you say with a garden growing you know that okay well it's already i've come back to it and it looks different but it's exactly the same but because your perception you know that what you've learned what you feel about the, the decisions that you made that's a very interesting thing and, and also the um, uh, it, it's it's in, in the in the case of code it's it's static it, it just stays as it was when you well left it behind but then something else starts to grow next to it uh, and you suddenly see that this is this is weird you know we we tried something here which worked well, but we didn't yet do it there. So hmm, yeah, this is uh, not good. So it, it's like house, the house itself, and the garden. You will have to keep um, keep putting work into that. And you mentioned there, we've, so we've done the ports and adapters, and you know you have the adapters that are kind of the external infrastructure. Uh, and, and one interesting thing is this idea of hexagons interacting with other hexagons. Uh, and like bounded context and, you know, kind of thinking of bounded context, we interact with other bounded context. Would you mind maybe kind of going a little bit further, you know, elaborating on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, th that's one thing I've liked about the hexagon is that you can uh, draw a nice big diagram of everything that is in your system. And maybe it's a simple system, but you could have many services connected to each other. And what I also find interesting about hexagons is that even if the designer of, of another service hasn't been thinking in terms of hexagons, you can still draw your own hexagon for their system. <laughs> so if you look at the, um, the output communication that is, that is coming from, from your application and it's going to talk to a database server, uh, in fact, the database server, uh, we are talking to its input port, basically. <laughs> we're, we're just sending messages to uh, a port that it has for communication with the world outside. Uh, and probably it, it also has some output ports like uh, going to the file system, writing to the file system. Um, maybe, well, there are some other smart things that you can do with uh, with this database server. But at least you could draw a hexagon for it. And you could even say that maybe there is the web uh, client, but it may also have something like a, a local uh, a CLI client that, that, that you can use to connect to it. So it has, in fact, multiple ports, maybe even for communication. So that, that, that's what I like about the hexagons and how you can... Uh, create these diagrams for them. And you mentioned bounded context as well. The idea there is that uh, that every service uh, would have its own space of knowledge, basically. And uh, that's something, well, and you also mentioned the idea of having, having all these microservices, um, basically forcing you to keep these things uh, separated. Uh, I think you can also accomplish the same thing with, um, or in fact, I know you can also accomplish the same thing with modules within the same project, within the same application even. So that that's indeed some advice that I, w I would give, um, like try to first modularize the whole stuff inside the same application and and then maybe consider to uh, to take these things out. What, what you can do is at least uh, recognize whenever you need something from a different uh, context or a different module, if you like, to, to, to let it also talk through an interface uh, because in, if you keep this stuff working in your application, you don't use any of this microservices stuff, then you can still show that this, this is a potential place of uh, swapping things out or making a, making a different kind of connection in the future. 
so it can show you where where the connection points are absolutely and i think it's funny because like reading like the building microservices book sam newman says the best way you can you know design microservices is by actually having it all in one monolithic repo first designing it that way because it's a lot easier to change it there than it is to because that's when it kind of it naturally kind of distills into what the different boundary contexts are what the different responsibilities are as opposed to you know moving a bit of code is a lot easier than trying to orchestrate you know this massive you know microservice architecture you may have yeah yeah that's right yeah i mean if you're after it for good reasons i think that there are good reasons for that then uh, uh by all means you could start maybe extracting some some stuff to services but I think it's it's good to do it not too soon. Uh, like you said, you you don't know yet where this where the boundaries are. Where where does this context end or begin? Or uh, so it, it can be smart to uh, figure that out first. And you mentioned you know you do a lot of workshops uh, on this topic, and and it would be really interesting to to kind of like learn like what what do you find that people teaching these concepts like what what do you find that certain you know is there a kind of pain point certain like hard learning points that you find that are kind of typically kind of you know arise yeah well i think the issue for me is always to make the point clear usually i have a project that is uh sort of structured in a traditional way and then we refactor so we try to make it do the same thing but but well organized and this is a completely different approach from knowing how this works and starting to apply it from the start of a project uh, so this is, I think, the the most difficult thing to um, in terms of education, where at the end of the workshop, some people always feel like this is indeed over engineering, right? This is a lot of work. We we didn't really achieve anything <laughs> because I don't know. Maybe they they thought like uh, uh, everything is working already, so why should we have to change all of this stuff? Uh, well, I think that once you know about this this the, the rules and the, the layers and the ports adapters etc and you apply it from the start you will end up with a very very clean project and it, it doesn't take more work or more effort than it would if you would ignore all of this uh, in my eyes uh, shiny stuff so yeah I, I think over engineering is is not an issue uh, for all of this in fact um i i was thinking about this uh, uh today because i, I realized that Every time, every day, uh, as programmers, we have to make all of these decisions. Uh, and I've read some somewhere that you have only a limited number, in fact, of the decisions you can make on a single day before you have to shut down and <laughs> go to bed and wait for a new day to come. Um, very much recognize this uh, this aspect in, in in writing, for example. Like at the end of the day, it's really hard to get written anything you no, know, or to get written some code in in fact or some some blog article um because i have used all my decision space um <laughs> yeah you basically. For the day. you'll get your you'll get your credit boosted <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> yeah ju just wait <laughs> you know and it can be very frustrating but what i feel about this architecture thing and all of these rules these, these design rules they uh, save you some decisions <laughs> uh so you, you can just keep these things in mind you can follow them on a daily basis it's like a best practice you don't have to think about all the time and then you have more room uh, like mental space to think about the decisions that are more interesting more um, uh, like basically they are they will be about domain knowledge or how you can represent some concept in your code uh, and and that's uh, i think it's it's very useful just because of this if you can save yourself some decisions yeah you should definitely do that so we've spoken about the hexagonal architecture uh, and, and i was just wondering like would it be able to just discuss kind of how it differs and relates to a couple of other architectures such as like the onion architecture and then the clean architecture that some people may have heard of yeah it's, it's interesting um i i didn't actually read about the clean architecture more than just uh, uncle bob's article uh, on this um which i think is is interesting and is it's definitely corresponding to uh hexagonal uh in fact more more hexagonal in combination with the layering uh because the this, this dependency rule uh comes from him and he, he's just uh saying more or less the same thing like depend on on uh, lower layers uh he also has his book on clean architecture which i didn't read yet so that's that's something uh could be on the list but there's also like onion architecture i, I don't really know anything about it except that people say like make, make jokes about it uh, peel off uh, layers and uh, <laughs> you know yeah, and it it can be the same uh, comments on uh, on this layered architecture thing. Absolutely, like hexagonal. It's like, well, then you've only got six ports. It's like, no, no, no. 
It's only a name. I think. I think the yeah ports and adapters. I think even the make uh, the, the creator, the inventor of this Agon architecture, he's even gone to say he prefers ports and adapters. Am I right in yeah, thinking? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is because it's it's definitely a better way of kind of envisioning it. Well, I, I've had this issue where um, uh, I, I wrote. Uh, a book on package design it's, it's called package design principles uh, or principles of package design in fact uh, and and every title it has is is the name of a principle so it's like single responsibility principle and stable abstractions principle i'm, I'm writing a new book now and i was like yeah this should never happen in in my books anymore because I don't want people to look at the book and see all those principles and be overwhelmed, like oh, oh, what was this stable dependencies principles again? No, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to remember this principle name. I just want to know what was the advice behind it. And so that's for the new book. It's it's one of my rules, like uh, put the advice in the title so that you could just look at the the table of contents and know <laughs> what are, what are all the advices given in this book. Definitely, definitely. So, so we might ask it, uh, asking you, like, what what is this book, the new book, then that you're writing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's all very new. Um, I've just uh, I, I did a talk in, in uh, last week in Paris on uh, basically what I think basic object design rules, and yeah, it was to me it was pretty overwhelming the the, the responses that I got. It was like, yeah, you know, this is this is what's missing in education, or everybody should know this, and. Uh, and this, this pushed me, like it, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to put some more effort into this and describe all of the things that I think are important when you're simply designing classes to be used as objects, you know, uh, simple rules like, uh, uh, constructor arguments, uh, should all be required or something like we don't use setter injection or, uh, we can use named constructors whenever it makes sense or really basic stuff which I think will be very useful uh, for lots of developers as a sort of foundation behind their work with uh, with classes. Definitely. And whenever someone says, you know, everyone should know this, it then is the kind of is implied that people don't know this then. So someone you know, has to actually go and try and teach this. So it's very, you know, humbling. And, you know, it's very good that you do kind of spend the time to do this. Yeah, well, I, I love this. And it, 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 I think in everything that I, I do, I try to do that. So, uh, of course, I uh, I try to make money. But it's always um, in order to allow me to do all of this stuff, uh, like talk about uh, code and write the books, because that's that's n never something you can get rich from. It, it, there will always be something that is that should be rewarding about it in another way, like uh, being able to talk to so many people through a book and being able to um, to explain what I think many people feel, but they they well, don't have the words for it or something like that. They can't so, articulate it. Yes. And that's what I do with these things. Also with, with these blog articles, I just want some place where you can point to and say, ah, this is what I mean. Could we do something with layers or could we do something with well, whatever? Uh, I was just wondering, actually, it'd be interesting to know, like kind of how you divvy up your time and how you, you know, because motivation for doing blog posts, to doing books, to doing talks, to doing normal work, to learning new things. Like, How does that kind of, how do you balance all that out? Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, I found a good balance mainly because I, I can now do some programming for a company that basically allows me to work remote, uh, all the time, almost all the time. And that's, that's, I would say my major, uh, source of income as well. So programming is still the main part of my, my job. Uh, and then I, as I said, I, I always try to make room for all of the other activities and yeah, like motivation is rarely an issue even though i'm usually at home and i'm just like okay <laughs> what should i do now um you know I, I can do anything but um yeah i always try to follow where where there is some spark or where there is hmm, no this is interesting let's let's see where this is going oh it's uh, got the edge <laughs> and, yeah and it's it's for the for the blog post it was the same thing um it's that that was also part of uh, another post i wrote about uh, advice for if you want to start writing just don't write on your to-do list like write a blog post or you know it, it should be something that is interesting and it should almost go naturally if you feel like uh, ah this is fascinating and then just put something on paper and uh, and start publishing you know that's because and that's something that that uh, kept me at the beginning from uh, writing but i'm now like okay you know um probably someone else has already done this or wrote about this maybe even in a better way but it's it's never just trying to set a standard for everything you know it, it's also about trying to articulate ideas uh, becoming better at that um and 
anyway, every every couple of years, this has to be repeated. You know, <laughs> someone else has to do this again because it it will will be forgotten. In particular, in in this um, well era of social media, you know, this is everything is is just cool or interesting for a few minutes, basically. And it's like, you know, obviously the paradigms and things from the 70s that we even now are just rehashing, you know, programmers. Like, oh, my God, AI, this is so cool. It's like, yeah, it's been around like it, it's been around a long, long time before you were born. No, as you say, yes, because people, it, it kind of gets lost in the ether. Yeah, basically, we, we are reinventing this stuff. But um, I, I don't think it's really bad that this happens. Uh, basically, the same for, for packages or, you know, that's has been some comments some time ago like uh, uh we are all reinventing the wheel we don't need another event dispatcher right and that's the kind of thing where i feel like yeah we should definitely do that and it's learning isn't it as you say like you know your blog posts are helping you articulate to yourself and if it helps one other person great you know that that's my kind of feeling with the podcast is you know if i can help one person then that's an, you know you've done your job you know you've done you've helped someone that's really great yeah yeah, and I think it's a great way of, of doing that. And I, I think for you as well, it, it will also be about um, uh, hearing lots of interesting things, you know, and uh, that that's that's another thing also for conferences where you can just, you can do a talk and, and learn yourself, but um, it will also be uh, a way of picking up new things and meeting people. Um, and yeah, if there is someone who's interested in at, at this moment, uh, not next year or previous year, it, it's cool. You know, there's, there's at least one person you can... Uh, yeah, help with that. Definitely. It definitely enriches your life. But I say, Matthias, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I know we had kind of some CQRS stuff, but I thought maybe, you know, uh, definitely coming over the hour mark there, I thought I'd better let you go. Um, but it's been great talking to you. Uh, and we definitely have to, if, you, if you're if you up for coming on again to talk about CQRS, that'll be really, yeah, really sure. cool. <laughs> it was great to, to be on your show. Yeah. Awesome. All right, audience. Well, it's been another great episode and we'll speak to you again next week. Goodbye. You've been listening to Three Devs and a Maybe. You can contact us at contact at 3devsandamaybe.com or follow us on Twitter at the number 3, devs and a maybe.